Right, we have some alumni who and participants of the program, so I'd like to invite Ed, Kieran, Alex, and Holinga to come and join us on the stage. So I was, this is what we call a shameless promotion of pitch. So any startups who would like to apply go to the website. And tonight, I believe it's going to be filmed, uh, streamed live on Facebook Live, the whole of the pitch event. So can we just start by... Um, Thank you, boys. Come and sit, I'll move on over. <laughs> they're a bit, they're a bit <laughs> close, those couches, right? So how, how are you? Can you maybe share with the audience who you are and how you ended up at pitch? Well, I'm Dr. Asquar Hilonga, a senior lecturer at the Nelson Mandela African Institution of Science and Technology in Tanzania. Um, well, I was connected by the Royal Academy of Engineering, and I applied, and last year I got an opportunity to pitch at Palace. It's called Pitch at Palace Africa, and I was the winner. And many people have been asking me, okay, you are the winner, so how much did you get? <laughs> so today I have a response on that. Thank you. Okay, can you share us a little bit about your startup? Because it's quite, uh, what well, you do and it's quite... Yes, I am the inventor of water filter. It's called nano filter. This is a water purification system that removes all contaminants from water, and it can be tuned depending on the geographical condition, because the contaminants in water vary from place to place. So I use nano materials to target specific contaminants in water, and we remove these contaminants. And the business now is growing, and, and we have a, a business model in which we rent these filters to local entrepreneurs in Africa. And did you develop that technology yourself from the universities, from the engineering Yes, school? I developed this technology by myself at an, a university in Tanzania, but I did my PhD in nanomaterials in South Korea. Great. And yourself, do you want to share with us a little bit about who you are and uh, what you're up to? Sure. So my name is Ed Klinger. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Flock. Um, we're an early stage tech startup, we're based in London, and basically we do big data driven risk analysis for drones. So what that means is um, very quick elevator pitch. Go if you it. are sticking a drone up in the sky and it's flying above people and vehicles and buildings, there are lots of risks involved in that, and it's difficult to identify and quantify these risks before you and during your flight. So what we do is we basically gather lots and lots of data from cities in real time, like population densities, traffic conditions, and we feed this information to the drone operator in a very visual way, um, and we quantify the risk of that flight, um, which has lots of uses. The first is we can provide on-the-spot insurance for drone flights, but down the line we'll actually be able to <coughs> optimize flight paths in real time, so that when you're, let's say, delivering your Amazon package in two years' time or four years' time, you won't be flying directly over a busy school or a busy public park. You'll be able to avoid those situations and fly more intelligently. Do you think regulators, because obviously this whole drone thing is quite interesting at the moment, how there's going to be regulation, there's going to be changes. Do you see that what you're doing is going to be kind of uh, synergizing with that, so you, or trying to keep that one step ahead? With yeah, it's a good point. So I think the regulatory issue, there's a, there's a small chicken and egg situation occurring with regulation and technology. So innovators in the drone space and in lots of emerging technology markets are sometimes almost hesitant to spend too much time and resources and money innovating new products if they're not sure that those products will actually fit within regulatory frameworks. At the same time, regulators want the industry to thrive and they want innovation to occur, but they're not sure exactly how to regulate it yet. So it's a kind of who moves first scenario. I think that's one situation where startups have uh, quite a good head start in that they just heads down, have the time to develop technology and take a risk. So what we're doing is we're trying to fit within the regulatory frameworks and build a technology that can actually help make drones safer, work with regulators to do so. And how did you find out about Pitch? How did that come from uh, drones to the palace? Um, yeah, so someone just said, guys, you should be at Picture Palace, someone in our kind of co-working space. I didn't know much about it at the time. Um, looked it up, it said that you'd be able to pitch in front of the royals and maybe meet the queen. So I thought, okay, it's definitely worth a punt. And then a few weeks later was explaining to Her Majesty how we're using big data to guide drones, which is one of the strangest experiences of my entire life, but <laughs> definitely worth it. That's good, and yes. I saw, did, did, did the soldiers go off with, uh, did you run out of time? Or? Yeah, so you have exactly three minutes to give your pitch, and I didn't realize they were going to be that strict, because my pitch ended up being three minutes and three seconds. So the last three seconds, I was actually competing with 
trumpeters playing uh, another one bites Who the won, dust. you or the trumpets? I think they won, so <laughs> I stopped my pitch. <laughs> Very good. And guys, prison voicemail, is it one of those things that says exactly what it does on the... It is, the yes, I guess. Um, so we are a, a social venture, and we are using technology to make it easier for families to stay in touch with a loved one in prison. Um, How did you... Was it come up with? Well, I mean, all of us. Like unfortunately, it, yeah, everyone wonders whether we were inside uh, that for was some my next horrific question. crime. I, to, I was trying to. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm going to disappoint you. I, although I do have an estranged uncle who's inside. <laughs> um, no, we we learnt how expensive the telephone calls were for prisoners, and we'd been playing with technology and doing quite a scientific business model type exercise to work out a good market. Um, we discovered that prisoners basically were dependent upon phones, one of the few populations that are. And then we did a, a short Facebook survey once we'd had our brainwave about two-way communication with voicemails. And we got this about 60 responses within the first two hours of people saying how it would change their lives. And we've had similar you know, real responses since from people about talking to their kids for the first time in three years, that kind of thing. And you're saying it's a social enterprise. Is, what, is that how you, you wanted to go about creating a social enterprise? You were doing something else beforehand and saw that this is something you, you wanted to do. How did that come about? Um, initially, we were looking for a startup idea. Um, but when we realized that this could really impact people's lives in a positive way, and especially for such a kind of marginalized and forgotten community, um, we thought, well, you know, we really want to maximize our social impact on this, and we want that to be core to everything we do. So while we're structured as a for-profit company, we have this social mission, and we're working to measure our social impact, and that's going to guide our decisions in the future. And do you see yourselves as scaling this, because there's quite a few prisons around the world, that you think this is something you'll scale to? Yeah. You're focusing largely on the UK side. I mean, at the moment, we're focusing on the UK, but we're in 87 prisons now, so it's about 70% of the prisons in the UK. Oh, right. um, but obviously, there are massive applications overseas, especially places like the US. And how did you uh, find out about Pitch? Um, someone told me, uh, another accelerator, that we should apply, and she said it was a great experience. Um, so we applied. I thought it looked really good. And then, um, yeah, as Ed said, I didn't really know what to expect, but we ended up at the palace. And did you get to... trumpeted as well? Or you... uh, no, no, we, I think we got it. We were tight. We, yeah, we, we were very practiced close. practiced our pitchy timing. Yeah, very... And how's that experience? Because obviously this is something, you know, it's amazing. We've heard that, you know, saw the video with His Royal Highness and how, you know, really, open, really opening up the palace. How have you found it afterwards from the outcome? Because obviously all of, you know, there's been many demo days and this is obviously the most unique demo day pitching session. How, how, what's, what's, how have you seen the journey afterwards with people you've met there and doors opening and those things? So I think the, the um, idea behind Pitch at the Palace is, that, is the connections you make. And I think everyone that attends the Pitch is supposed to follow up with several companies. And then they actually track how many connections you made from the Palace. So we've just had you know, loads of emails from CEOs, from people all around the world interested in what we're doing and wanting to help in any way they can. And it's actually been uh, quite astounding. Yeah, great. And Ed? Yeah, it's been great. Like, really, really useful, actually, genuinely. So I think the, one of the big thesis of Picture Palace is connecting startups with large corporations and important people, basically. And it's done both of those things for us. Um, a big part of what we do, because we're in the business of kind of real-time risk analytics, is building trust around the product, um, which is sometimes difficult for startups to do because you're not very well known, you don't have a huge amount of money for marketing. Um, so having connections with large insurance companies who are at the event and important people who are at the event and having the royal seal of approval is obviously useful. That's good. And the boot camp, did you have to, how was that experience? Because obviously, can you share with us a little bit more from Pitch Africa to now? You're pitching tonight. Are you pitching tonight or? Yeah, I'll pitch here tonight also. So this is the answer to the people who were asking me, how much did you get after you won the pitch at Palace? So at that time, the BFID through HDIF were revising my proposal. I submitted a proposal on this water filter to take it from the lab to the market. And just imagine at the point when you are making a decision for a proposal, and there is a proposal of, of someone who has won the pitch at Palace, the, the Prince uh, uh, program. So in short, I won that grant. It is a uh, 350,000 pound, 
and it helped me to take really this filter from the market, uh, from the lab to the market. And also it created a lot of uh, credibility along my innovation and publicity. So surely I have been famous with, in BBC and <laughs> even appeared in the same video with the Bill Gates and it's, it's a lot of celebrity around this. And, and there was a lot of inspiration to young innovators in the, and entrepreneurs in Africa and around the world. I have received many emails of appreciation and just one of my YouTube videos have been watched by about two million people. So I said, okay, this is all I received from the pitch at Palace and I'm so grateful to the, to the York, Duke of York for this. Thank you very much. Can, can you share with, yeah, let's let, run with you. Um, can you share with us a little bit about, because obviously Africa is really quite an interesting uh, tech market, you know, how we've seen you know, the disruption of mobile and you know, it's really you're seeing from Tanzania, Kenya, some of these key markets. Can you maybe share with the audience a little bit about what you're seeing with the startup ecosystem there? Because obviously many of us here are familiar with Europe, with America, but Africa is one of those ones that's really quite interesting. And what, you know, you're a successful entrepreneur here now. What do you see is happening there in the tech scene? Yeah, the Africa we know like 10 years down the road is not like the Africa at present. Things are changing, and I think the stereotype mind also is changing. And I'm seeing technology being a breakthrough in Africa. And my water filter is a good example because it was not invented in Europe or in, in another country. It's in Africa, and it is transforming Africa. And I think what we were missing is that bridge, bridge, bridge between our innovation, our technologies, and, and the, the, the people who need it the most. So how to bridge this gap? And I think the Royal Academy of Engineering and, and the, the Duke of York are doing their best to bridge that gap, to raise innovators from Africa, to really use their own innovations to solve their own problems. And that's what we are doing with Nanofilter. Are you nervous for tonight? No, I'm so excited and I wish they <laughs> invite me one more time to pitch at the palace. Very good. <laughs> Great. And, and, and yourself, you, uh, so what advice would you give to, obviously, just generally, you know, you've had an interesting entre entrepreneurial journey so far for people who are thinking about applying or just generally some experiences that you've had as, you know, like many entrepreneurs finding their way, you know, it'd be good to share some of that with the crowd. Okay, well, so I was in a situation where I basically had to choose between kind of taking a secure job or um, throwing it away and trying to make a go of it as a tech entrepreneur. Um, I think that something that a lot of people say is just go for it and just, you know, forget what other people say, forget your worries, and just go for it and do, do the entrepreneurship thing. I think it's a very easy thing to say for people who have made it as an entrepreneur and who don't have to worry about you know, being able to feed their kids and stuff like that. I think the, um, maybe a more subtle piece of advice I would give is, is if you're lucky enough to be able to make that choice, then it's a great thing to do. And if you're doing what you love and you can support yourself, then there's not much that can go wrong. Um, so I've been very lucky in that I was fortunate enough to be able to do it and I've had the best time ever doing it and couldn't recommend it highly enough and if you're doing what you like and if you've got a good team around you then you're you're absolutely going to have an absolute blast no matter what happens basically and from you, you mentioned when you were at, you had lots of insurance companies doors open for you are you still maintaining those uh, connections and still going are you seeing there's some uh, yeah so without saying too much that's obviously, good. <laughs> um, yeah yeah we're progressing very quickly with with that side of things and the connections that have come out of picture palace have been genuinely very useful and you guys um i think one of the things that people who've got ideas often say to me is how are you going to protect your idea you know are people going to steal it um my advice would be people generally don't steal ideas you need to, the thing that's of value is engagement with customers. Don't be scared about showing your idea to real customers, sharing what you want to do. Speak to absolutely everyone you can. You, we, we regularly speak to, you know, yesterday we were at the House of Lords, but on the same day I spoke to prisoners, prisoners' families, ex-prisoners. So you've got to speak to every level of the organization and just go for it. Because nothing proves whether your idea has value, like actually sharing it with someone and seeing whether they actually want to consume it. Because if they don't, you're just wasting your time. You could spend ages perfecting something that nobody really wants to pay for. That's great. And yourself, final words to share to aspiring entrepreneurs or um, stories? Yeah, I think one thing I realized from doing prison voicemail is a lot of the conventional wisdom around startups is 
you should do something that you would use yourself, solve a problem that is something that bothers you and other people will want it. And I think that's, that's great advice because you're one of your own customers. We actually did the opposite of that and we built something that we have never really used and hopefully will never need to use. Um, but it's worked out really well because we looked at this market of people who basically don't have anyone trying to solve their problems. Um, and the kind of goodwill we get that we receive when we get these customer calls, people saying, this is brilliant and I can't believe someone's actually done something like this. Why didn't anyone do it before? Um, it just really makes a big difference to us in terms of our daily work. And I think it's reassuring that you can learn about a new market completely from scratch just by talking to as many people as you can um, and, and then put something out there of value to people. I think that's a really nice uh, way. I think you just summed it up of saying that you guys are looking to solve a market where no one's really looked at and uh, shows you that obviously there's a business model and there's a social good and there's a way um, of you know, giving and receiving. So guys, I'd like, can we all give them a big round of applause? Can we all make sure tonight we're looking forward to your, uh, you. to your session?